Hello there and welcome. My name is Sarah Cheney Cambon and I'm an economics reporter at the Wall Street Journal. I'm excited to moderate today's webinar on the OECD's employment outlook. Over the last two and a half years, we've seen some pretty drastic changes in the US labor market. In the spring of 2020, we were talking about record high claims for unemployment insurance, and today joblessness is near uh, historic lows. Employers are continuing to crank out new jobs, and workers across many industries and income groups and racial groups are reaping relatively fast wage gains. At the same time, those gains are vulnerable to the rising risks of a recession. Um, today, we'll be diving more into whether countries across the globe are emerging from the pandemic with more inclusive labor markets. We'll start off with a presentation on the OECD employment outlook, followed by a moderated Q&A. You can submit your questions via the, the Q&A box. Please specify your name and organization, and we will get to as many questions as we can during the second half of today's webinar. The report that we're discussing today is available at oe.cd slash emo. And today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all registrants in the coming days. So look out for the email in your inbox. Um, before we get into the presentations, I'd just like to introduce, introduce today's speakers. Um, we have Bill Spriggs, who is a professor in and former chair of the Department of Economics at Howard University and serves as chief economist at the AFL-CIO. In his role with the AFL-CIO, he chairs the Economic Policy Working Group for the Trade Union Advisory Committee to OECD and serves on the board of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Mr. Spriggs was appointed by President Obama as Assistant Secretary for the Office of Policy at the Department of Labor, where he served between 2009 and 2012. We also have Stefano Scarpetta, who is the Director of the Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs Directorate of the OECD, where he leads the organization's work across the areas of employment, labor, migration, health, skills, gender, and tackling inequalities. Stefano's team at the OECD works closely with countries in the design, implementation, and evaluation of policies, drawing from evidence-based analyses of economic, labor, and social outcomes. We also have Stefan Carcillo, who is the head of the Jobs and Income Division in the Directorate for Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs at OECD. He is also a research fellow at IZA Bonn. He previously served as an economist in the Fiscal Affairs Department at the IMF and as Labor Market Advisor to the Fringe Minister for the Economy, Finance, and Employment. He is the co-author of Labor Economics, which is published by the MIT Press and has published many research art articles in the fields of applied and theoretical labor economics. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Stefan for a presentation on the employment outlook. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Good morning to everyone. And a big thanks for joining us for the presentation of the 2022 edition of the Employment Outlook. It is here. And a big thanks also to our good friend Bill Spriggs for being with us and of course for commenting on this edition of the Employment Outlook. I give the floor immediately to my colleague Stefan Carcillo, but let me say that the title of the Employment Outlook is Building Back More Inclusive Labor Market. I think a shorter title would be A Tale of Two Prizes, because indeed the labor market in the United States as well as in all the OECD countries was barely moving out of the COVID-19 crisis when a new crisis hit our economies, our society, the cost of living crisis. And in the employment after we discuss how the labor market is doing as well as the policies that are needed in order to for workers, companies and our economies to basically try to cope with this new, new crisis. 
With no further ado, let me actually share my screen for the presentation and then pass the floor to Stefan for the first part of the presentation of the outlook. I hope you can see uh, our screen. And with that, over to you, Stefan. Thank you, Stefano. So um, yes, indeed, I mean, I'm going to present first the situation of the labor market, which really is going to um, uh, show this, uh, the tale of these two crises. The first thing I would like to show you is the recovery in terms of employment of the labor market since the onset of the, of the COVID crisis. And what you see on this chart is the um, total employment um, um, uh, with um, uh, a base 100 uh, just before the, the crisis in December 19. And uh, you see that, uh, well, thanks to uh, a very, very massive policy support, uh, the economic recovery from, from the crisis had been actually faster than we expected originally. Uh, the employment in the OECD returned to its pre-crisis level at the end of 2021, and it has continued its growth about at a slower pace into the first half of this year. Um, employment growth has been particularly strong in a few countries, such as uh, Australia uh, and Mexico, in the US uh, and in Japan. Uh, actually, the recovery in terms of total employment has been slower than in number, a number of, of other countries. But it actually, it has reached its pre-COVID level as of August 2022. Now, if we turn to the situation of the labor market, when we look at another indicator, which is the unemployment rate, uh, we also see this uh, recovery. Um, so we have three points on this chart, um, the latest data, the peak uh, during the COVID crisis and the pre-crisis level. So first, uh, this is the uh, latest data. You see that uh, now the uh, um, Unemployment rate is about uh, slightly less than 5% in the OECD. Um, it's about 3.7% in August 2022 in the US. This is actually at or below for uh, almost all countries, the pre-crisis level. And this is way, way below uh, than what we observed at the peak of the crisis. You see in the, on this chart that actually two uh, countries stand out, Canada and the US compared to other countries. When it comes to the unemployment rate reached during the crisis, this pertains to uh, the use of temporary layoffs uh, uh, in, these, in these countries, as opposed to uh, the recourse to short-time work schemes um, uh, in, the, in most of the other countries. Uh, uh, people actually under these short-time work schemes, even when actually they were zero hours, were uh, counted as employed. Uh, in the other countries where actually most of the people in temporary employment were actually uh, as a country as an employee. Now, uh, even though the recovery has been fast, uh, it's very uneven. Uh, here you see the average change in uh, employment by industry uh, uh, when we compare the first quarter of 2022 to the first quarter of 2019, which is comparable. Uh, and you see um, a, a big difference between uh, 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 low pay industry on the left hand side of this chart, such as accommodation uh, and food, uh, uh, leisure uh, activities, uh, admin support, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, more technical uh, services, uh, information and communication, professional scientific services, where you see we actually have uh, uh, experience a very uh, steep growth in terms of, of employment. In the US, we have a, a similar pattern. Uh, some low pay industry saw so employment growth as well, but overall, the employment growth was stronger in high pay industry than in low pay industry. Uh, uh, for instance, in the, the first quarter of 2022, employment in food and accommodation was still 7% uh, lower in the US than it was. Uh, uh, for the same quarter of uh, 2019. So these patterns actually um, uh, have significant implication for the evolution of employment outcomes for different groups, because we know that um, lower skilled uh, workers and young workers are more likely to work 
uh, in these low pay uh, service sectors, such as accommodation and food and, and leisure activities. And this is actually what we see when we look at the, uh, um, uh, the situation of, of young people in particular. Um, in this chart, you have uh, the evolution of employment among young people, again, comparing the first quarter of 2022 compared to the uh, first quarter of 2019, you see that actually employment has recovered in a number of countries, but in the almost more than half of the OECD countries, employment has still not fully recovered for uh, uh, young people. And it's because actually a number of these young people have uh, uh, remained uh, more frequently inactive. I mean, some of them are in education, but some of them are just not looking for a job, which is worrisome. And, and, and some also uh, of them actually are, are unemployed. So uh, in the US, uh, um, uh, US actually is, 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 is part of the countries where uh, uh, the uh, employment situation has not fully recovered yet um, in the first quarter of 2022 for young people. So this is worrisome in terms of um, uh, career prospects uh, because we know that uh, uh, there are scars of uh, unemployment and inactivity for young people when they enter the labor market in this situation that can actually last for uh, uh, many years and the quality of jobs, the, the wage can actually suffer uh, for several years uh, for these young people. However, we don't see right now a deterioration, at least in the quality of contracts. We don't see a steep increase in, uh, in uh, unstable contracts for young people in the OECD at this stage. <clears throat> well, despite this, in 2022, um, uh, we have uh, evidence of very strong labor shortages in some sectors uh, in many countries. In the second half of, of 2021 and early 2022, actually, vacancies surged uh, to record levels in many countries in some sectors. Here you see uh, the share of firms who report labor shortages in two sectors, manufacturing and services. Um, and you see a, a steep increase. This is for European countries. I will show you some other evidence for the US in, in one moment. Um, uh, uh, and interestingly, um, we don't see any indication at this stage that uh, these labor shortages stem from some mismatch between uh, the skills demanded by companies and the skills that workers have at this stage. Um, Rather, we see that actually these shortages across countries um, uh, uh, arise primarily from the difference, from the speed of the increase in labor demand in recent months. I mean, companies have posted so many vacancies at the same time uh, 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 because they rebounded very, very quickly after the COVID crisis, also because of the uh, stimulus packages. Uh, uh, that actually that created a, a, a very, very tight labor market. When we look at the situation in the US, here you see uh, uh, vacancies. Uh, on the left hand side, the, the, we plot vacancies and quits. Uh, and on the right hand side, we plot vacancies and unemployment. So in the US, um, uh, vacancies were uh, at least 50% uh, higher uh, in the first quarter of 2022 than they were before the crisis. And as unemployment declined uh, at, a, at a much, much lower pace, uh, uh, more recently, labor market tightness uh, increased very, very uh, rapidly uh, over the recovery, uh, reaching uh, levels typically seen much later uh, in the cycle. Uh, what you see on the left hand side is that actually, in very interestingly, uh, there is no indication that the, in that the increase in quits that uh, the US has, has experienced over the last uh, uh, year uh, is, is driven by people basically uh, uh, exceeding the, the labor force. Uh, uh, rather, we see that the increase in quit is very closely related to the increase uh, in vacancies, uh, which means that actually people are taking advantage of the uh, 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 situation of the labor market, which is very, very favorable with a lot of opportunities. And on the right hand side, you see that the, uh, the labor market tightness, which is the, uh, the, the ratio technically of vacancies to unemployment is rising uh, very, very steeply. Uh, uh, so a very, very tight labor market in the US at the moment. Uh, so these pressures actually have led to uh, what is perhaps the clearest peak in, uh, up in nominal wages across the OECD. 
Here you have the evolution of wages uh, in the US and in the UK for uh, three sectors, manufacturing, uh, uh, leisure and hospitality, which is, includes food and, and accommodation, and also more generally the private sector. And um, uh, you see that the, the, the increase in, is particularly strong in leisure and hospitality, where nominal wage growth stood at 8.2% in April versus 6% uh, 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 for the whole private sector. So this reflects uh, uh, very, very strong tensions in, the, in these sectors uh, um, that have struggled to recruit in the aftermath of the COVID crisis. However, uh, uh, what's really striking is that despite these in increases, uh, the increase in nominal wages uh, remain below inflation, and this is what we're going to see now. So here uh, on this chart, we have uh, a projection uh, for 2022, year on year, uh, of the increase in nominal wages and the uh, increase or rather, I should say, the decrease in real wages. So you see very steep increase in nominal wages in a number of countries, including the US, despite these, uh, these evolution, uh, uh, the real wages uh, uh, as of July are, are projected to decrease overall during the year of 2022 because the increase is not enough to cover fully uh, inflation. <clears throat> now, and this will be my last slide of the presentation of the situation of the labor market. We're moving from uh, uh, a health crisis into uh, a cost of living crisis. Uh, the prices of, of energy and food uh, affect actually uh, particularly some households, the low uh, income households, much more than the high uh, income households. Here you have the share of uh, consumption on food and energy by income quintile. So you see that the bottom 20% of households spend uh, about 50% uh, uh, more uh, on these items than the top 20 quintile. And you see that actually the increase uh, in food and energy uh, uh, um, uh, spending is also much bigger as a result for uh, uh, low-income households and for top-income households. And with that, I give the floor back to Stefan. Sorry, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. So, uh, the second part uh, of the presentation, which is indeed also a significant part of the outlook, is what can be and what should be, or what has been uh, the policy response. The point that Stefan was making is that uh, some of the same groups, so the low paid, those in more unstable precarious jobs, young people, minorities, have been deeply disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 crisis. There is plenty of evidence in the employment outlook, and to some extent, the same group, in particular low-income households, are affected now by the new crisis, the cost of living crisis. So in the employment outlook, of course, we focus more on those policies in the labor market and social policy areas that can actually help, especially the most disadvantaged groups, to cope with this new shock, this new crisis. The first point that we would like to make is that the energy and food price crisis is basically a major cost for our economies and our societies. And basically no government by themselves, no companies, and certainly not workers can cope, can absorb this cost. So of course, the main question that all countries are struggling with is how to share in as possible fair way, this massive cost associated with the rapid increase in energy, food prices and commodity prices. So one of the, of course, a major tool that our society have to share uh, or to discuss how to manage uh, this, this crisis is actually through collective bargaining. So what you have here in this slide is the two standard indicators of where we stand in terms of collective bargaining. On the left hand side, you have the number of workers who are member of trade unions. You can see there has been a significant decline in most of the OECD countries, certainly low in the United States but actually declined in many other countries. And on the right hand side, you have the number of workers who are covered by the agreement made uh, through collective bargaining. Again, there the situation is somewhat different, but certainly a number of countries, there's been a significant decline. So to some extent, one of the major tool to discuss or negotiate how to share this cost has weakened over the decades. And this has a number of implications. 
On the one hand, we are not back in the 70s and 80s, in which many countries had an automatic adjustment of wages to inflation. And this, to some extent, will likely prevent to put in motion a kind of a price wage spiral. But on the other hand, workers have fewer, if you like, uh, tools and means to actually make sure that the sharing of this cost is as equitable as possible. There are a number of interesting examples. We can go back into the Q&A session. In Germany, for example, in April already, the chemical sector, which is a big sector in Germany, did not renegotiate the contract because there was too much uncertainty. And instead, they provide a lump sum amount to all workers, the same for everybody, so of course, much more generous for the low pay, and postpone the negotiation to the end of the year. A number of companies are providing a bonus, a lump sum again, and then waiting for the negotiation to take place later. In countries like uh, Finland, there's a two-step bargaining process. One, actually, to provide an immediate relief to workers, in particular low pay, and then a postponement of the full negotiation later on. Um, again, in Germany, there has been already an increase, which is below the inflation, but certainly a significant increase in nominal wages. So, one of the points of the outlook indeed is that we, we need collective bargaining and collective bargaining can and should play an important role in the sharing of these costs, despite of course, all the effort that government have put in place. Companies are also struggling, especially those that rely on energy in a significant way. The second policy tool we are looking at is actually the, uh, the statutory minimum wages. 30 countries of the OECD have a statutory minimum wage. You can see that if you look at the evolution uh, from uh, last year, so 21 to 22 of the nominal minimum wages in a number of countries. This is not the case in the United States, where we know that the federal minimum wage has been remained constant uh, since 2009. But in a number of other countries, there's been a significant increase in the nominal minimum wage. But if you look at the real minimum wage, then you can see that in many countries, uh, the real minimum wage has actually declined. There are only a few countries in the OECD where there is an automatic adjustment of the minimum wage to inflation. This is France, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Some other countries have adjustment that take place on a regular basis. In most of the other countries, it's actually a decision that is taken by the government. As I said, the figure here for the United States is perhaps not uh, comprehensive because we know that uh, a number of uh, states within the US, the 22 states, I think, have actually adjusted the, uh, their own minimum wage in the context of the rapid rise of inflation and the cost of energy. And sometimes the increase actually has been pretty sizable. But certainly the federal minimum wage has not contributed to somewhat the cushion, uh, the impact of the prices, the increasing prices on the low paid workers. The other point we discuss is actually the way to provide support to all of those affected by the significant hike in energy and food prices. Here we look at the two type of measures income support on the one hand and price support, but also we look at those who are non-targeted measures, which are the one in yellow, and the measure which actually are targeted. And you can see that in the US, both the transfers uh, and to some extent the indirect tax reduction and price regulation tend to be uh, focused on non-targeted measures. A number of other countries have adopted a focus more, especially more recently, I would say, in targeted measure. Of course, it's easier to put in place measure which affect everyone. It's easier to put in place. Of course, they cost a lot of money. And going forward, to the extent to which this hike in energy and food prices will stay with us for quite some time, one of the recommendations in our employment auto is actually to shift from generalized measure to actually more targeted measures, focusing on those most affected by these energy and food prices, in particular, low income households. Remember that you know, we are also promoting a transition to a greener economy and generalized measures to reduce, for example, the cost of fossil fuel may to some extent slow down also what was a needed transition to renewable energies. So this is an important point. There is a lot of debate, but I just want to put it on the table as one of the important tools to actually provide relief to those most affected. Um, the other important point, Stefan was referring to the fact that we we are in a tight labor market with many vacancies, a lot of work is moving, and of course, facilitating the transition from one job to the other, reducing any possible mismatch that may exist in the labor market is more than ever important. That's why I think the other message of the employment actor is to focus on active labor market policies. 
What you have in this chart is they increase, the number of countries that increase resources for labor market policy, including training retraining, guidance to a job seeker, both in 2020 compared to 2019, 21 compared to the previous year, and also in 2022. Good message here for the US is that it's one of the countries that has continued to increase the resources for active labor market policy. That's certainly a very important message. At the same time, I think what becomes really important is actually profiling job seeker and identify what they really need. So it's the quality of spending and making sure that we can provide adequate support to all of those looking for a job or wishing to change job. The other important feature of the COVID-19 crisis, which is spreading over, of course, into the new crisis, is also that we know very well that some categories of workers, what we call frontline workers, have been essential during the COVID pan pandemic to actually allow all of us to continue to, and our economies to continue to function. These are working in the healthcare, long-term care, essential retail. Uh, as you can see here, um, they tend to be concentrated among the young people, low paid, and to some extent, racial and ethnic minorities. Um, this is true in the United States, it's also true in the European Union and in the United Kingdom. In our view, it's very important because there is shortage, as Stefan was saying, also in these frontline type of jobs, many of which are low paid, with working with precarious working conditions and actually difficult working conditions at all. So one of the message again of the employment outlook it does, it is important to improve not only pay, but actually the working condition from the frontline worker. Uh, those who have been again working during the pandemic and those where there is shortage now in most of the OECD countries. So here you see the share of the OECD country that have increased the pay or at least have promoted negotiation for the increase in pay and actually provided one off uh, support uh, to the frontline workers. The important point is to move for this one-time crisis reward that was given during the pandemic into more structural reforms, structural changes that actually improve working condition and pay for these workers actually in a more sort of sustained way. So it's an important message that we have. And the last we want to share with you before opening up the Q&A is actually that thanks actually to the support of the United States the Department of Labor, there is an in-depth analysis of the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on ethno-racial minorities. This is the chart for the United States. As Stefan was saying, the, um, both the Black people and the Hispanic uh, Latino people have been deeply affected uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. You see that the fall in employment was much larger than for the white, and it took longer for them to recover as well. So uh, if you look for the black, actually, we have to look into the first quarter of 2022 for the employment rate to be at the same level of the Y. So not only was a bigger shock, but actually was a more prolonged shock. And here, I think the point we want, to, uh, we want to highlight is that while many countries had even before COVID-19 a number of measures to help the full integration of ethno-racial minorities into the labor market, it is important that some measures were put in place during the COVID-19 crisis. But again, the point is to make sure that they will be supported also on going forward. You see that on the right-hand side, the share of countries where uh, public employment services have difficulties, for example, in reaching out job seekers from racial ethnic minorities. And you can see that was difficult before the COVID-19 crisis has become also difficult during and post COVID-19. So I was saying before, invest more on labor market policies. I think there is certainly a need to invest more in targeted measures that deal support some of the vulnerable groups, including for sure also ethno-racial minority. So these were some of the main messages we have in the employment out. There is much more in there, but I very much look forward to hear from Bill and for all of you, your questions and comments on our main findings. Thank you. Great. Thank you both for that uh, very enlightening presentation. Just a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, please drop those in the Q&A box and we, we can get to those in a few minutes. Um, I'm going to start out with a couple of questions myself. Um, this one, I, I, I would be curious to hear from um, Bill Spriggs on this. Um, how beneficial has the job market over the past year or so been for 
US workers. And how long do you expect that those benefits could last given what we're seeing with the, the Fed raising interest rates? So thanks for the question, Sarah, and thanks to um, Stefan and to Stefano for their report. I, I just want to say something really quick in response to your, your question, Sarah, to highlight how important I think this report is and how important the work that the OEC does. The portion of the report uh, that concentrated on collective bargaining highlighted a couple of things. First, as uh, Stefano made clear, uh, a lot of economists have in their heads that cost of living adjustments are a big part of union contracts. And uh, that's so 1970s. <laughs> that's not the case today. There's no built in cost push for what's going on in inflation. And as he pointed out across the OECD, real wages are falling. So it's not that wages are pushing uh, inflation labor share in the US in fact has declined during this period. Profits are up by a tremendous amount, which is why collective bargaining is so important. A check on the huge markups that American corporations have been placing would be workers being at the table and saying, oh, well, wait, if you're gonna just hike prices, where's our cut? It would dampen a portion of the inflation that we're seeing. And I very much like that LSAC uh, is, is, is saying this in terms of a cost of living crisis. That's a better way of thinking about what we're observing. So for American workers, big wage increases for leisure and hospitality because 26 of our states have raised their minimum wage and that showed up in the chart that was presented. That was very important for helping those at the bottom because in previous situations of weak labor markets, the adjustment has been to push down on those wages and in real terms and the warning that uh, Stefano made about the falling value of the federal minimum wage, which affects not the majority of Americans, but a huge chunk of Americans because we still have 24 states that did not raise their minimum wage. So, um, so there are a couple of key things in their chart. Thanks to the OECD for paying attention to racial um, divisions in the US and the UK where we have the data. So we, we, we get a picture of the slower recovery because of the frictions of discrimination that these workers face. And in the case of um, Hispanic workers, particularly being overly represented in the food sector and, and other low wage sectors that it took them longer to see this recovery. I think the labor market is healthy, but what the Fed is doing right now is exceedingly dangerous. This is a cost of living shock. This is not an inflationary shock. And we do need to concentrate on how do we help people with the cost of living that is caused by these shocks, a lot of which are caused by global warming when you think about the food crises and the overall reduction in food production that we've seen. The Fed, by treating this as if it were inflation, is acting as if in the next moment, we're gonna see unions demand 50% wage increases because inflation is up 12% and we're gonna have these inflationary expectations lock in. This report is very important because it points out across the OECD, that is not what is happening. That in fact, collective bargaining is put on kind of a freeze in some of the European countries. In the case of the US, we saw a strike with our railroad workers, which has to be resolved because the workers have to vote on the contract. They signed a contract for 5.6% annual wage increases. Their big strike was over dignity. They were striking because they were being disrespected when it came to their ability to take simple sick leave or family leave. And so this silliness, and it's silliness on the part of the Fed to ignore this wealth of evidence in this report is so important for ingraining in people's minds, we're not in 1970, wake up, it's a new century. This is 50 years later, it's a different world. And this report is so important for doing that. The threat is this, last month, 
For two months running, the Black unemployment rate has been going up for all the wrong reasons. Black employment to population ratio is down. The number of Black workers you know, having jobs is down. That's what that means. Black labor force participation has fallen because despite all this word about job openings, um, job openings have been declining. That number has a whole lot of noise to it. It's clearly correlated to something real. Black workers are responding to the something real and these fewer job openings has made Black labor force participation decline. We saw unemployment went up for Hispanic workers. They are exceedingly sensitive to the construction industry, which has already slowed. And despite everybody saying, oh, well, the unemployment rate in the US went up for the good reason, that is uh, people re-enter the labor market, but all of them didn't get jobs. That's a problem because people are saying that these job openings actually mean the labor market is tight. For the first month, those who entered the labor market actually had a much harder time getting a job than what we saw previously. Previously, new entrants were much more successful in landing a job than they were in showing up as unemployed. Last month, for the first time, new entrants were far more likely to be unemployed than to be employed. That's a reversal. So I think last month gave us an inflection point on how the labor market is, is operating in reality. And that means that the Fed blew past its uh, stopping point several interest rate hikes ago, and their continued insistence that they're looking at built-in inflationary expectations is um, going to damage the labor market. It already has damaged the labor market for Black workers. And uh, I think we're gonna continue to see that uh, unfold for other workers. Construction, as it turns down, is going to deeply hurt Hispanic workers who are, who are heavily concentrated in construction. So there was no built-in recession. I want to be clear on that. This was the strongest recovery we've ever had. One thing that wasn't highlighted, this is the quickest we have ever returned to employment in the United States from an employment downturn. Even from the very mild downturn we had in 2001, it took us years, years to recover. And we've done that in two years. This was a, a remarkable recovery. It would have sustained itself um, and workers and the economy need room to, to navigate these price changes. Uh, but this report is important for highlighting it's not the labor market that's pushing up prices um, and, and that this strong labor market was doing a lot of good for a lot of workers. Thanks. Um, I wanted to, to ask either um, Stefano or, or Stefan, um, I thought that the charts at the beginning you highlighted um, about that showed employment in um, lower wage industries like food services uh, still being down a good bit from pre-pandemic levels is, is interesting. I, I wanted to get your take on whether you think that it's just a matter of time before employment in lower wage industries recovers because there's there's demand there from employers or if you think that growth will will be sluggish and in, in employment in these lower wage industries given other you know headwinds in the economy well th thank you sir i think it is a very good question and um the evidence, I think, suggests that these were sectors deeply, deeply affected by the COVID-19 crisis. So, of course, they were recovering much more sluggish than other sectors that have been actually been able to reopen and to restart activities. But I think it goes beyond that. It is more on the demand and on the supply side. I mean, if you think about uh, uh, travel, I think, uh, you know, this pandemic was a change and I, I think a structural change to some extent that will affect also this sector uh, going forward maybe less so for hospitality or for leisure sector, but certainly there has been a sluggish recovery in this sector. But there is also an issue on the supply side, because I think some of these sectors tend to be characterized by low pay, unstable, or to some extent, not so good working conditions. And in a booming labor market in which there were job opportunity elsewhere, a number of workers may have reconsidered whether they want to go back in the same job they had before in the same sector with low pay and with the difficult working condition or try to move somewhere else where maybe conditions were somewhat better. How long this will stay? 
Well, if it was not because of the new crisis we're living in, the cost of living crisis, with a booming labor market, this sector would also have continued to recover. Again, taking into account some of the structural changes that are affecting some of them in particular. But the second point, and this brings me back to the, to the question you raised and the answer that the bill provided, with which of course I also agree, is that of course, as we know, the labor market respond with a lag to the evolution in our economy. Uh, just the next week at the OECD, we release our interim assessment. So in between two major projections, we actually issued the interim assessment, which will revise our macroeconomic projection we deliver uh, at the beginning of June. Perhaps you won't be surprised if I tell you, without giving you the specific numbers, that our revision are downward revisions, so significant revision downward, both in terms of 22, but actually into 2023. So it's quite likely that the buoyant labor market we have seen so far will be affected by this uh, significant deceleration in, if, in economic growth, if not actually some country moving into, into a recession. And therefore, some of the good outcomes we have seen, this big quick recovery in the labor market, will actually not be uh, lasting very long. The last point I want to mention is that uh, the reason, one of the reasons why the recovery was so strong, economic-wise, but also from the labor market, is because our economies were, what we can say, on steroids. So they were strongly supported by significant public investment. I mean, the trillions of dollars put in the US, the billions put in Europe, to really promote this quick recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. This is good because basically led to a strong recovery, but of course, depending on how the resources are used, may actually have an impact on the debt to GDP ratio of the country. So it is crucial to uh, maintain the type of structural investment that the recovery plans were meant to do, but at the same time, take into account the short-term challenges that the cost of bleeding are raising. Um, we focus on the low paid and the low income also because obviously they are the one most affected, but within them, there are also differences which make targeting sometimes difficult. For example, those living in rural areas are much more affected by the energy costs than those living in urban areas. All the workers tend to be more affected by, by, by young uh, workers and young households because of the heating they need, they need to spend on. So targeting, in our view, is essential. Doing a proper targeting is not that easy because you have really to understand who are those most affected by this new shock, the cost of living shock related to the energy and food prices. Um, Bill, I, I wanted to ask you, because I, I had seen you um, tweet some about this. I think it's an interesting uh, topic. Obviously, high inflation is um, pretty harmful for workers. But as the Fed raises rates, um, the potential trade-off of, of higher unemployment is, or could actually be worse for, for some workers than high inflation is. Is that kind of what you've been thinking? Um, Absolutely, because uh, people have this notion that only those who lose their jobs lose. But when you weaken the labor market, you weaken wages for everyone. So if prices are rising, you're lowering the real wage for me. So, so you're not making things better for me. If my real wage is falling, I'm worse off. You make everybody at the bottom worse off and you make some tragically worse off because if you're unemployed, inflation doesn't mean anything because you can't afford anything. Uh, so th th this is so misguided on the part of the Fed to try and give us crocodile tears as they eat up people at the bottom. Uh, it it's important to note in this report um, the, the last couple of charts looking at how the US has responded. People forget the importance of the Inflation Reduction Act that just got signed by President Biden. It has a lot of directed resources to help low income households with energy costs. There's a huge amount of investment that will take place to help low income houses, households um, improve weatherization of their homes, um, to, to, to make um, improvements that are energy saving uh, for, for them, uh, highly targeted as the report points out. And on the affordability side, we know one of the biggest drags for older workers, and, and Stefano was talking about this uh, just a moment ago, some of the problems for older workers, this relief on drug prices 
that older workers will now get because of, the, of, of that act being put in place. So there are things that the United States is doing, thank goodness, because of the passage of that Inflation Reduction Act that are on the positive side that you see in this report. And the other thing is though the United States is on a fiscal contraction, because as Stefano pointed out, um, all of that uh, that we pumped into the economy has to be paid for. And the fiscal policy overall is contractionary, but what the Biden administration has done is increase investments on labor market training and labor market assistance. So, so we're, we're shrinking the federal government, but we're making increases in investment where things can matter for workers. Uh, that's another important thing in this, this report, and, and I hope people don't lose sight uh, of that, because there are key things that are in place to help those at the bottom, even though the Fed, in my view, is should they, they, they should stop saying we're making low income people lose jobs for their benefit. This is, it, it's infuriating. Um, one thing I'm curious about and, and anyone can, can answer this question, um, is there a scenario in which workers actually emerge from the pandemic with sustained bargaining power. And I guess we could focus on the US, but if there's a, kind of a, a global answer to that as well, um, I'd be interested in hearing. For many years, the OECD has reported on the lack of dynamism in the labor market. We're finally seeing a dynamic labor market where workers are moving to higher wage, higher productivity industries. Normally, the OECD is lecturing people. We're not seeing that. It should be taking place. The history of the United States in the 21st century is we lost millions of jobs in manufacturing and gained millions of jobs in restaurants. At the beginning of the 21st century, we were a manufacturing set of workers. And now, uh, pre-pandemic, we had as many manufacturing workers as we did restaurant workers. That's, that's a weird kind of allocation. Uh, we return to the same number of payroll jobs, but those payroll jobs are far uh, greater in higher wage sectors than in low wage sectors, and workers are making that movement. If we don't make the labor market fall apart, as the Fed is trying its best to do, in response to actually having the Shantarian creative destruction work to transition workers to higher productivity jobs, if we don't have that happen, then yes, it's sustaining. Um, applications for organizing a union in the United States are rising at a record level. Workers in the service sector and information and technology sector, all of these sectors are seeing workers doing their best to organize. So I think the tight labor market definitely helps because in the United States, we haven't modernized our, our labor laws. If you volunteer to organize a union in the United States, you will get fired. And so, so having a tighter labor market certainly helps in, in trying to organize workers knowing that the violation of our labor laws are rampant. We see this with Starbucks. They will do any and everything in the United States to punish you for organizing. And so a tight labor market is one of those things that gives workers a little more confidence because when they get fired for trying to organize a union, they, they have a sense, I'll, I'll get another job soon enough. Maybe that if I can chip in on this one, because I think Bill is absolutely right. I mean, the kind of very quick and strong recovery in our economy and labor market, we have engineered also through significant public money, which pour into the, into the economy, is creating tension, tightness in the labor market. And this, of course, gives <coughs> workers uh, more bargaining power, even in some of the low pay industries and sectors in which uh, low pay workers do not have a lot of bargaining power. Uh, this is, of course, a temporary phenomenon, which is related to the fact that we are a pretty tight labor market in the US and elsewhere. <coughs> I think perhaps uh, the other important point is this new crisis, the energy and food prices crisis, is also to some extent uh, um, requiring employers to sit at the table with their trade unions and worker representative to really discuss how to handle these unprecedented, because this was uh, I think many decades ago, when we had a similar level of high level of inflation 
and energy prices. And in fact, some of the example I was referring to you is indeed in countries where there is a traditional collective bargaining, but actually where collective bargaining has been revamped because again, the companies are very worried about you know, how to handle the increase in energy and how to possibly handle a significant increase in wages. And in some of these cases, these sort of revamping collective bargaining were promoted by public uh, intervention, but in a number of other cases were basically voluntary a uh, decision taken by the two social partners, the employee and the worker, to sit down and to say, oh, how are we going to handle that? The case of the chemical industry in, 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 in Germany is an interesting one because they, 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 they so much uncertain. They said, if we set basically a collective agreement for two years now, and we take into account the very high level of inflation, this might actually indeed trigger a price wage spiral taking place, at least in that sector. And this might actually promote the same thing in other sectors. So they say, let's give something to workers, in particular, something to the low paid workers to help them cope with the short term challenges. Let's see how the situation evolves. But let's give us more time to negotiate and to find a better agreement. So I'm saying that uh, um, it's not only that collective bargaining is a tool that is particularly important this time, but actually social partners have realized that. And I think there's been more and more attempt to sit down around the table and to try to see how to cope with this shock. Sometimes with the strong promotion on the side of government, sometimes by simply the social partner doing it among themselves. Um, and just wanted to uh, alert the audience for just a last call for uh, submitting questions to the to the Q and A box. We have just a couple more minutes in here, so I could get to um, an audience question or two. Um, on, on the topic of like the wage price spiral, um, I, I think there there seems to be at least somewhat of a, a general consensus among U.S. economists, American economists, that um, in the U.S. a wage price spiral seems pretty unlikely, um, given what we're seeing in the data and kind of. Um, just like the, the fact that unionization, as you pointed out, is, is down a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, I guess the question is like, is how big of a threat is a wage price spiral in, in countries outside of the US, so Europe, et cetera? Um, yeah. If you wanna take that one, um, either Stefano or, or Stefan. Yes, um, well, it, it isn't likely in the US right now, what we see in European countries is that we don't see a lot of signs for this spiral to appear neither, even though, even though uh, the minimum wage, for instance, has been much more reactive uh, of role in European countries than it's been uh, uh, in the US. Uh, and we could think that actually uh, for a number of sectors where there's a lot of minimum wage workers, these increases in the minimum wage that has been uh, substantial in a number of countries could actually generate uh, higher prices. And we don't observe this, uh, at least for the time being. So we have to remain very prudent, obviously, uh, but we don't observe this. Uh, overall, in Europe, uh, like in the US, the um, wage negotiating institutions uh, um, at the firm level, but also at the sectoral level or national level are not equipped uh, to deal in an automatic manner with inflation. So basically what we saw, as, as Bill said, in the 70s where um, there were automatic indexation or almost automatic indexation clauses in a number of agreements, all this has disappeared. And now um, we don't have any mechanisms except in very, very few sectors in very few countries where we have this automaticity of adjusting uh, uh, wages to uh, to not only to uh, uh, observe inflation in the past, but more importantly, to foresee inflation in the future. And so, um, uh, right now, for instance, the, um, the most of the agreements we've observed in Europe uh, at the collective uh, uh, at the sectoral level, most of these collective agreements. Uh, were based actually on projections of inflation uh, for the uh, for the year that were way below that when we were observing, or were just uh, aiming at catching up with inflation uh, over the last few months. 
So it's a very different, uh, I would say, institutional, shift, institutional setting than what we had 50 years ago. Maybe, Sarah, just one observation on that, because again, the, 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 the evidence is a bit scattered there, but what we see, not only in the high pay sector, I mean, the digital sectors and so on, but actually a number of the middle to low pay sectors is actually a request from work, not only in terms of uh, trying to be at least partially compensated for the rise in, in energy and food prices, but actually for better working conditions. So I think one of the things we have learned from the COVID-19 crisis is a rethinking of the way in which we work. We have discovered that many jobs can be performed pretty effectively also to remote working, but more generally, there is a rethinking of uh, actually working condition, especially among the young generation. So I think uh, as part of the bargain is not only to deal with the short-term issues of how to cope with this uh, cost of living uh, crisis, but actually rethinking a little bit working condition. This is actually taking place even in those sectors or low pay sectors in which you know work have very little bargaining power and therefore very little say about uh, sort of negotiating or discussing with their employers about working conditions. Again, we shall see whether this leads to significant improvement, but given the tightness of the labor market, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, negotiation taking place also on the working condition, not only on the pay. It's a very important point because in the US, we've exposed horrible working conditions, even for a powerful union like our railroad workers who, who have been historically powerful from the 19th century. They were arguing about decency. This was the big thing holding up the negotiations. And, and in the US, you, you also have to remember uh, the change from the 1970s is our contracts are longer. The negotiation with the railroad workers covers four years. Most of our unions are locked in to wage increases that were set in place way before we saw this spike in the cost of living, and they will remain in place for a couple of years to come. So, so this is an overreaction from the Federal Reserve to claim that, well, we have to dampen uh, these inflation expectations. It's not built into this, these fears of inflationary expectations are not built into the system. And uh, the short-term damage of, of retreating from improving working conditions will only exacerbate things going forward. Because if we don't quickly resolve these issues that people want about regular hours, about better scheduling, about having sick days, if we don't resolve this now, we're gonna prolong the problem that we have for these low, wage industries and recruiting workers. And that's not good for anybody. We will come out of the slowdown that the Fed will have enforced with an eight year recovery, not a two year recovery of the labor market. It will take us another decade to finally start to clear these bad practices that have, have just become so evident. Um, well, I hate to end it there, but um... I think our, our time is running out here. Really appreciate um, everyone's time. Thank you, Bill, for, for making some time for us. And then um, Stefano and Stefan uh, for presenting that insightful outlook. Um, the recording of today's webinar will be emailed to, to everyone. And um, I think that's, that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you very much to Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Sara, for moderating this uh, session. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. Thank Very you. Thank you for you. the wonderful report. Thanks. Thanks. Very good to see you again.